You're not going to record this. Yes, we're going to record. <laughs> so don't say anything you don't want to. Um, all right. Um, I'm sure that more people will be coming in. It's always hard to rope people back in when they start talking out in the hallway. Oh, I know. It's all those conversations out in the hallway. That's the, that's the good stuff. All right. Well, it's, it's my pleasure to introduce Rick Clark. Um, many of you know Rick from his, his videos. He's certainly been a leader in uh, no-till organic. He's a fifth generation farmer from Williamsport, Indiana. The main goal on his farm is to build soil health and achieve balance with mother nature. Rick has developed and is constantly improving a systematic approach to regenerative farming. He is most proud of incorporating regenerative farming practices with all acres being certified organic. He calls it regenerative organic stewardship with no tillage. He suppresses weeds and builds soil with cover crops and no tillage. He cares deeply about human health, and it is an important driver behind the organic no-till style of farming that he's developed. And he is building a system that will be viable and profitable for generations to come. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Rick. So here's the advancer. Feel free to walk around, but you do have to hold this mic really close up so we can all hear it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Don't, don't go too far away or hang on this thing. I, I'm absolutely honored to be here. This is probably one of the most honored events that I've been asked to come and speak at, and I want to tell you why. <laughs> This lady right here, first of all, let's give her a huge round of applause. Each one who taught me and other farmers how to plant beans and sort of right food stage, roll down later. And that was the basis for us going into organic no tillage. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, everybody, we got to we got to roll. I'll tell you what, that panel before was awesome. Thank you, everybody, on that panel. Questions were great. I start my presentations with this slide now because this is so important. This is the immediate family. It takes the support of everyone that's involved to do what we're going to talk about today. These are drastic things that we're doing. There's not a lot of it going on, at least to, to pretty very large scale. Um, you know, I often say if you've got negative people around you, you've got to get different people because you can't afford negativity. You need positive emotions at all times. I graduated from Purdue, uh, fifth generation farmer, been practicing about 38 years now. Wife Carol, uh, daughters Jessica and Rachel. Uh, Rachel's on the farm with her husband Eric. And Jessica married another farmer about 45 minutes away, and they're on their family farm, so everything's good. Um, my father, Richard, um, I have to give him a lot of credit because dad did more than, than teach me how to farm. He taught me how to think, and there's a huge difference between that. Thinking and farming, huge difference. When we're doing these systems that that are looked on by our neighbors and wondering what the world we're doing out here, you have to be able to move quick and be nimble, and you have to be able to react to, to situations. In 21, I went through the alphabet of plans and actually started over on capital letters. So don't think that you're doing something wrong because you're into the capital letters now. It's okay. Because Mother Nature has certain ways of humbling you, and also she's trying to guide you on where to go. Nephew Aaron is on the farm. Aaron loves the financial side of the equation. Uh, no tilling soybeans for 18 years, corn for 13, cover crops for 13, and farming grain for 11. These are the things that got us to where we are today. And when I, I graciously gave Erin her credit or credit is due, it, it's true. Everything that our basis started on was on those no-till soybeans and syrup. That's where all this has come from. At home, our neighbors farm two crops, corn 
and soybeans. And that's not that's not a system we don't have. That's that's a monoculture. We're up to seven crops now, uh, not in any particular order: corn, soybeans, wheat, alfalfa, peas, milo, and cattle. Cattle's not for everyone, but if you want to build soil health the quickest and the most efficient way, cattle need to be part of that operation. The plus one is regen. Regen is when you take an acre out of production and you give it everything you possibly can. You give it a cold or uh, a cool season package, you give it a warm season package, and then you get it set up for next year's cash crop. And, you know, the panel earlier talked about how when people were in transition to going organic, they were always trying to set their farm up to be corn that first year coming out, because that's when the money always used to be. So sometimes we rethink those things and we think we have to move to where the market is. But what I want to also say, though, is corn is the hard crop to get your cover crop set up correctly for. So I've given you three outs on how to do that because I'm in what I call a, nor a, a northern cold state, Wisconsin. Same thing I get every time. Great, we're too far north. The season's too short. It gets too cold. It's too our growing season's too short. All the I've heard them all. But I've given you cereal grain in the in the rotation. I've given you livestock, and I've given you regen. Do not double crop soybeans behind a cereal crop. Bring in that warm season cocktail and let it rip. Because how many times do we get, to, even in Indiana, how many times do we get to plant a warm season cocktail? Not very often. Just so you understand where I'm from, everyone knows where Champaign, Illinois is. Just come straight east into Indiana and then we follow both sides of the line. 5,100 acres certified organic, but this is organic with no tillage. Remainder of acres are in transition. No starter fertilizer, no fungicides, no seed treatments, no insecticide, no PRK, no ag line, no nitrogen. Organic with no tillage. Now, the the no ag the no ag line applied in eight years line. That I, I like to look at that. I know there's many factors that the that dictate pH, but our that our pH is 6.8 and it's rising. Because we've taken away the salts and the acids and, and we bring our system more into balance. I know there's many factors that, that attribute to that, but that's some of them. And sometimes you have to look at validations because you have to say, are we what we're doing? Is it really working here? And those are things that I think validate that what we're doing is working. But to get to this point, we've got to do things like this. This is my definition of farming green. Now, right in that video right there, this is not what we do currently. But in that video, we're planting corn. And everyone says you can't plant corn in the cereal, right? Well, yes, you can once you understand the carbon and nitrogen ratio, what's going on, and you understand the power that cereal rye has of sequestering nutrients. I do not buy into the fact that corn and cereal rye have an allelopathic effect on each other. I buy into the fact that the cereal rye sequesters tremendous amount of nutrients that are going to be available for that corn plant. So with this in mind, if you're still using some synthetic fertilizer or even organic fertilizer, you've got to get nitrogen in, into the front end of this program. We do not do this anymore. That right there is at 80 to 90 pounds of cereal rye planted last fall. Typically now, if we do cereal rye on the corn, it's gonna be 30 or 40 pounds, just because we still need the diversity. Benefits of farming green. Again, is the underlying theme here of, of this presentation is maximizing what the cover crop is intended to do. Okay, so now we're into the issue of RMA. Well, 
later on you're going to see, but I no longer take crop insurance be four years now, so I don't have to worry about our back. But these are real situations we have to worry about because we will never terminate until after we plant. Hardly ever. There may be a, a rare situation, but for the most part, termination is after we plant. So uh, right here you see, I don't know if the pointer's working, maybe not, but this is now been the previous video you saw. We then rolled the field down and the corn was at B1, and that's what we're left with. So there's the corn grown. We are on 20 inch row spacing corn, 20 inch row spacing beans, okay? If I was to update equipment, I think 15 inch is, is probably going to be a, a number I'm going to land on for row space on corn. Maybe do some more drilled beans. Sequestration of nutrients. It's unreal the power that these, these species have. I've got slides coming that will demonstrate that. Nitrogen fixing. I think too many times in the past, We've gone out and planted these legume packages in the fall. We go out on May the 5th and we throw our hands up and we say, there we go. We lost, we lost our legumes over the winter again. We didn't give them enough time because they haven't even really come out of dormancy yet, especially in a, in a cool state like this one. Growing carbon. This is the buzz. My only advice is take Go slow, take it easy. There's still a lot of rules and regulations that gotta be worked out. And the most important thing is do not think you're going to save your farm on a carbon market. It's not gonna happen. 25, 30 bucks an acre until they really get things straightened out. I'm not, I don't know if they ever will. I don't know. I probably will never be able to play the way they're facing the rules. There's probably people in this room who won't be able to play because they're wanting you to make change. I don't know what else I can change from a I'm taking everything away. So the way they currently have it structured, uh, the people who are blazing the trail probably will not be able to participate. Erosion control, I don't care where you live, there's always erosion. Increased pounds of biomass. That's what the world I live in now is all about. 10,000, 12,000, 13,000 pounds of dry amount of biomass is what we need to suppress weeds. This gets hard. This gets really hard because we're trying to get as cross as many acres as we can so we can get the cover crop planted in a timely fashion. And I'm telling you, you do not realize how important timing of planting cover crops is in the fall is until you take chemistry away. Because the amount of biomass that's required is huge. So rye planted on September the 5th versus rye planted on October the 25th will be a huge difference next spring. And that is that basically is the biggest attributing factor to whether a field yields well or doesn't yield well. It's typically because of biomass. Feeding the microbes, we have to figure out how to feed microbes year round. It doesn't, it just doesn't matter. You've got to do whatever you can to keep a living root growing or have some kind of a batch or mulch like this available for those microbes. Something. Armor in the soil. This right here is a great example of that. This spring, I've never seen, we had the wackiest weather in Indiana I've ever seen. And you can blame any bad weather you had on me because I told my wife early in the season it was going to be a smooth spring and that was the end of it right there. It just went downhill from there. But I can remember planting soybeans the first week in May and it was 95 degrees out. I've never seen it that warm in Indiana before. And as 
we have to, when you pull in the plant, you've got certain things you need to do when you get to one of them is pull your thermometer out and stick it in the ground. Well, I had to open up the canopy and stick the thermometer in, wait for the, the temperature to balance out. It was 70 degrees. Ambient air temperature 95, it was 70 in there. There was a bare spot over here, put the thermometer in 110. That's what kind of difference in temperature I'm talking about, but you don't have your soil armor. And I can't imagine there wasn't, there probably was not a microbe left alive in the top two inches at 110 degrees. So we've got to keep this microbial biome happy and keep it moving at full throttle. Limit evaporation, that also goes to the example I just made. We worked so hard to build aggregate stability, water infiltration rates, water holding capacity, increasing carbon. We do all these things so that when it does rain, we can save the moisture that's in that profile. I, I was lucky enough to have our, our soil health specialist from the state of Indiana come to the farm this summer. They went out and checked three or four or five fields for water infiltration rates. The average rate that we have on our farm right now is 20 inches. 20 inches an hour is what we can take, and it is being pulled into the profile. I want to save that moisture for the dog days of summer in August, late July and August. Suppress weeds, that's what it's all about now. We've got to do this with no tillage. I know this is hard, and I want everyone to understand that that it's taken me a long time to get here. I do not have this perfected, not even close. It's not even close, but we are getting better all the time at it, okay? So if you get the notion to do what this wacky guy from Indiana is doing, do it on small scale and do not jeopardize the livelihood of your farm. This is very important. What drives our system? Building soil health. That's what it's all about. If I don't have soil health, I don't have anything that I previously put on the slides. You know, I, I sacrifice yield to maintain soil health all the time. I will not spray anything, even if it's honorary approved, to combat army worms. I will not do it. I've read the label, I've gone through, I, I know, they, we're going to target one species. I don't see how that's possible. There's beneficials that are being killed along the way. We need the beneficials to build soil health. <laughs> diversity. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about this a little bit later in the presentation, but diversity is very, very important here. Cash crop rotation, I, I showed you earlier, we have seven crops in a rotation. This is why we can get through the growing season with, with limited pest problems. You know, we don't, we haven't had an army worm or a black cup worm or even a pest issue in the last two years. And I think it's because we are doing so much toward increasing the sugar levels that we've now deterred the pests from coming and, and wreaking havoc on our cash crops. So all of this comes in time, it comes in the way we're doing things, and the crop rotation is part of that. Now, with that being said, I'm going to admit I'm probably going to plant a few more acres of beans than I thought I would have. Based on what that panel talked about earlier, the market is signaling that to you to do that. I mean, when you can get a, I've got a, a bids in hand in the high 30s for soybeans. That's insane. Might as well take advantage of some of that. Data collection, this is critical. To get to a lot of the slides that you're going to see me present, it takes data to get there. You have to baseline where you currently are. You know, I don't care what your current operation is, 
and maybe you want to and maybe you want to add some more drastic measures. You want to start pulling inputs away, or whatever the case may be. We got to know where you are today. So then when we sit down and look at this a year from now, are we gaining or are we going down? What is happening to our system? Got to collect data. Our own soil, already talked about that. Building human health. This is not thought about enough. I look at building human health as two ways. Nutrient density, which we are in the last 25 years, we've, we've decreased nutrient density by 30%. That, that's, that is ridiculous. We're supposed to be living in the greatest country in the world, and we're going to allow our food to be decreased in nutrient density. I, I can only attribute that to one thing our soils are tired and wore out and absolutely dependent on synthetic fertilizers. I've seen it. The second way I look at human health is I am no longer going to expose my family and team members to the harmful pesticides and insecticides. I'm not doing it. I don't care if it's on rape roof or not. We don't use anything on our farm, nothing. Now, I may consider what I would call loose term stimulants. Stimulants that will wake up certain parts of my microbial biome to help with shortcomings that we may currently have. That's where it ends for me, though. I've never put anything on our farm. Building human health. Being a good steward is way more than, than number one of build, building soil health. Being a good steward is self explanatory. If you've got a wash or a cut in your field, fix it. Get a waterway built. If you've got a tile hole, fix it. Because those things just suck dirt and, and minerals and chemicals and fertilizer into the, the drainage system and away they go. ROI, return on investment. That's what it's all about. It's no, we're, we're no different than any other company. We're trying, we could, uh, you know, if we were four and the goal is to make a, a million cars a year, but you don't make any money doing that, what's the point? It's all about ROI. It's not quantity, it's quality. Now, I do not talk about yield very often. And I did go to Purdue, and I know that you have to know what yield is to make this calculation. I know that. That's about where it ends for me. Because this is the last bullet point on this slide, and you don't see yield on there. Yield is not what drives this system. I don't sit around at home and say, boy, we got to have 212.3 bushels of corn to make this thing float. If you do everything we're talking about here and you reduce your input load on the front side, yields come along. And everything I've been talking about so far is balance, a symbiotic relationship with Mother Nature. There's a test that we do now, it's called the Haney Soil Health Test. We've done it now for about eight years. And in this test, it it has a plethora of information. There's, a, there's an abundance of information. Two of the things that I'd like to talk about when I put this slide up are predator to prey and bacterial to fungi relationships. And this is in this report that the Hay test will give you. Predator to prey. I get asked often, how can you plant non-GMO corn without any insecticide? It's because we're heading toward balance the species that preys on corn rootworm is, is in our system at enough to keep the corn rootworm at bay. So this goes back to my soil health line. I sacrifice yield to maintain soil health. If I do something that disrupts those beneficial species, we're out of balance. You know, one of the analogy I like to use is coyotes and rats. If you shoot all the coyotes, all the rabbit population takes off. You introduce coyotes back in, the rabbit population goes down until it balances out. 
That's what I'm talking about. Bacterial to fungal. When we started taking these tests, we were clear over to the bacterial side of the equation. We have now shifted it to about 65% fungal. That's probably as far as I want to go with it. Because we don't want to go too far and get out of balance and go all fungal. But the point is, we need more fungal in the system than we currently have. So the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi are the communication backbone network of the microbial biome. There will not be any transactions take place below our feet unless it goes through that fungi. So this is why I pound on tillage so hard. Because if you're tilling the ground, you are destroying this microbial community. And when that microbial community gets destroyed, it can no longer function as that communication network. It now takes all its energy to rebuild that community just in time to bring another pass of tillage through and wipe it out again. That's why I, I just pound on tillage. I, if you're going to till, that's fine. I'm not saying that what you're doing is wrong. I'm just saying in my mind, I want to preserve these microbial communities and let them thrive. And we have to do that by reducing or eliminating tillage. This is a picture of our row unit. Everyone wants to know how sophisticated it is. It's very unsophisticated. There is no row cleaner. There is no coulter. There is no two by two fertilizer. There's nothing. There is a Keaton firmer there, but we don't use that Keaton firmer anymore. It's just there for the ride. It's very simple. I like the unit. It when, when you when you try to do the best you can and try to minimize compaction, I don't care who who we are, what we're doing, we all have compaction. All of us. We have to figure out how to minimize that compaction. Now, there, I don't have a pointer, but up here in the upper left, oh, yes, I do have a pointer. Up here in the upper left-hand corner, there's a cylinder right there. That cylinder is a hydraulic system from pre precision planting. Now, within that system, you're running this with an iPad, and in the iPad app, there is a tab called As Applied Downpours. And what they've done is they've taken the weight of the row unit, which they know what that is, and they do the math from the weight of the row unit to the number that you put in the cap that you want the range to be in. So the reason why I feel like the hydraulic system is important is because when you take the care that we do to not be on these fields until they're fit, when we plant, we are running negative numbers. That means we're lifting. There is no down force. It's lifting the planter. So I need that hydraulic cylinder to hold the row unit where it needs to be. We plant corn three inches deep. We plant soybeans an inch and a half. I want to hold that depth throughout the field. So that's really the only sophistication on that plan. Weapon of mass destruction number one. I don't care what your flavor is. I don't care what your color is. I don't really care how you get it out there. Get the cover crop out in the field as timely a fashion as possible and get headed toward wheat suppression. Now, I've not had great success with airplanes, but I think something I need to be looking into more, and I just happen to have a neighbor that can do this. We need to get a highway in or whatever you call the big, the big uh, heavy thing. And, and they put on those cover crop kits and they blow the cover crop into corn that's starting to, leaves starting to turn brown. That probably needs to be implemented a little bit more on our farm just because of the sheer acres that we've got to get across. Obviously, we have to wait till the combine's done for this rig to run. So that just keeps pushing us later and later and later into the fall. 
Weapon of mass destruction number two against chemicals. This is the baby. This is the 60 foot INJ roller tripper. I don't sell anything. I again, whatever your flavor is, if, and if you're going to start doing this, I don't think you have to buy a roller tripper to get started because my suggestion on how to start this farming green would be. Uh, soybeans and cereal rye. And when the rye gets to anthesis, you can step on it and push it down and terminate it. It doesn't take much at this point. So don't think you need to go out and buy some fancy fancy roller just to get your appetite or your curiosity taken care of because you probably got a rolling basket, a coal packer, Probably got something in your arsenal now that will do it for the time being. Livestock. I think this livestock is not for everybody. But if you have the ability to get to some livestock, and maybe even better yet, somebody else's livestock, let them figure out how to keep them alive in the winters in Wisconsin. I don't know how you guys do it up here. I mean, I thought it was full of coal. This is cold. So let somebody else keep alive in the wintertime. But if you can't get an opportunity to bring cattle in from, say, May to August, do it. And the soil health just, it, it, everything accelerates. In the fields that we really, I mean, we research all the time. And <clears throat> aggregate stability is very easily measured in the profile. Maybe if I have time, maybe I'll I'll give you my two cents worth on these carbon markets a little deeper. But anyway, when when we look at aggregate stability, we were at about a two to two and a half inch zone, and it just stayed there, and stayed there, and stayed there. We did, we brought cattle in on, on one particular field, and within two years we went to six inches of aggregate stability. Wow. Now we're talking. Think of the more space we've created now. Think of the room we've got for this breathing of the soil. In my opinion, the top two limiting factors, this, you're going to think I'm nuts, but in my opinion, the top two limiting factors for yield in corn is water and carbon dioxide. Now, wait a minute. Carbon dioxide? I thought that's what's going up and creating problems. It, it is, but there's also not enough carbon dioxide being transpired out of the soil profile. Where's the stomata out on the corn plant? It's on the bottom side of the leaf. It's there for a reason, because it needs to capture that CO2 that comes up. Sorry, Aaron, <clears throat> you can't breathe anymore. The power of cereal rye. This is what I was talking about earlier. So we're going to go out and we're going to, we're going to, first of all, let me back up. This was a cornfield. We went out in the fall when the corn harvest was over and we drilled, no till drilled 100 pounds of L bond cereal rye. That cereal rye grew in the fall, I don't know, four or five inches tall, went into dormancy, came out of dormancy, and then next. The next spring, we're going to eventually plant beans into this field. Okay. So now you go out about the size of these squares on the floor, about a two foot by two foot square, and you measure that out and you clip everything at the ground. And you put it in a bag and you ship it to the lab. Now, I don't know how else to do this because there's so much more we're not even capturing with all the roots. I don't know how to do that. If somebody knows, talk to me up when it's over. I don't know how to capture all those roots. But anyway, above ground, this is where we're going to get to. So I'm going to venture to say that most cereal rye in the United States is terminated at this height because everyone's scared of that it's going to get away from them and get out of control. So look at what 12-inch rye has brought into the equation of just the above ground material. In four days, if you just wait four days, 
it would have grown six inches and gotten to 18 inches tall. Look where the nitrogen number is, 120. Now we start to understand what's happening here. Probably at this point, the carbon to nitrogen ratio, I'm gonna guess is probably 60 to one. We have got a tremendous amount of nitrogen tied up. This goes back to my thinking process of there, there, if there is an allelopathic effect, it's very minimal. This is more powerful. And then look at the 0060 column, that's the potash column. It's at 213 pounds, the biomass, is at 4,000 pounds, that's not enough. 28 inch right, we're up to 134 pounds of N and we're at 281 pounds of 0060. Do you get, do you understand why we've not applied any P or K in eight years? This is why. Because we let the cover crop go to maturity. Thank goodness when I did this test, I had my brain hooked on, and I came back and took a sample two months later. So this rye was rolled with an INJ roller trimmer at June the 1st, and this is August 1st, 2nd, 3rd, somewhere, somewhere two months later. So as you can see, you can do the math from 281, I can't, clicker's not working now. You can do the math from 281 to 65. Now, is all that available now? No, but at least half of it is in the first 30 days. That's enough for that soybean crop. Now, I'm always trying to look at what makes dollars and cents. What makes sense? So if you just merely for the fact looked at it from a potash point of view and the cost of that cover crop, it's a no-brainer. If you just look at those two, but think, look at everything else that's coming in. And folks, when you get this test back from the lab, it would fill this wall up here, my slide would. But you got boron, you got sulfur, you got, well, I think I got sulfur on there. Yeah, you've got uh, molybdenum. You've got so many other things that are not even on this list. Now, the thing that I think is the most intriguing here and I, I gotta, I've got to put a, some more brain power into this, is look at the, the 046 O column. It doesn't even change. So a lot of this stuff's being tied up in that rye for even two months after termination. So what I've done now with this test is we go out every Monday. And when you get that first warm day of spring and it's coming out of normalcy we start on that next monday and we sample from monday in april all the way through every monday until november now i can see where does this pee and where does it exhaust hopefully i'll have a slide build on i don't have a lot of time anymore hopefully i can build that slide one of these days the power of balance of fixation clover and the reason why my pick on Balanza fixation clover is because I have to use species that we can mechanically terminate, okay, with no tillage. This becomes very difficult because you've now narrowed the window down to not a lot of things. But fixation clover is one of them. Again, same thing, two foot by two foot square, take your samples. Again, I'm going to move through this in a hurry. Um, I've got these same two slides in a little bit later in the presentation, but I'm, I'm going to move through this in a hurry. So June the 4th now, that again, folks, this is just above ground data, above ground. Now, this is where I would lean on Erin and her people to come up with what I'm about ready to say, because I think we need this. And maybe somebody's already working on this and you can help me out. We need to figure out how to score nodulation below ground. What does that equate to in pounds of nitrogen? Because I don't know how to do that. So we just need to come up with a score. You know, if you've got a nodule that measures this amount of circumference and it's this color and it's this, this, and this, and this, that equates to 
100 pounds of men. So remember, this is just the foliage, the, the green part above ground. These numbers are insane. Four days. In four days. Look what the numbers do. Is all of this available now? No, it's not. But I've been doing this long enough that I'm going to take credit for half of that nitrogen number. So this is where we are in the point of my presentation when I say, okay, look, I am way wacky. I am way over here. You don't have to come over here with me. I'd love for you to come over. I need your company, but you don't have to. Let's come right here and let's take credit for half of that in up there and let's eliminate that amount of synthetic fertilizer. That's where, that's all I'm asking. That's it. But the only way to get here is to farm green. You've got to let this stuff grow. Rick, I don't want to plant corn on June the 8th. I, okay. How about we plant corn on May 28th? And then you wait until June 8th to do termination. Now, folks, I can't tell you what the date's going to be when this happens. I, I don't know. And I didn't, I, and unfortunately, I did, again, you can't think of everything. When I took that January 8th sample, I should have taken it, uh, I'm sorry, June 8th, I should have taken a June 9th, a June 10th, a June 11th, and a June 12th. Just to see when this thing peaked out. I did not do that. Look at the biomass. That's dry matter, 12,700 pounds. So when we pulled into that field to plant this, this jungle, you didn't walk through this like I'm walking around up here. You are high stepping your way across because you're going to trip and fall on your face. It's so thick. Now, when we pulled in, with to this field with the roller, it was 12 inches deep when we were done rolling. When we started rolling, it was about this tall. When we got done, it was 12 inches. How the hell are you going to plant corn in that? They expect that corn to come up through there. It's very, very difficult. So I'll tell you what I did on this particular field. I decided that we can't do this. So we pulled out a flail chopper and we chopped this field with a flail chopper. Everybody knows what a flail chopper is? It's got a hood on it. It takes your crop up, hits the hood, comes back, hits it again, basically sizes everything in an inch and a half or two or small pieces. So then as I'm doing this, my brain is, is thinking, oh my gosh, how much CO2 are we releasing in the atmosphere and how much nitrogen? So I made a couple phone calls. And the people that I respect with that I called said, don't worry, you're not doing any harm. There may be a little bit of CO2 and a little bit of nitrogen going into that surface, very negligible. What you're actually doing is sizing the product to be released quicker into the profile. So that's what we did. So again, this goes back to what I said earlier. You've got to be flexible and nimble and able to think and react at a moment's notice. So what we did here was flail chop today, waited two days, and then came in and planted the corn. Okay? Again, I had my brain hooked on, and we came back, whatever that, what is that, Matt? Six weeks, I think. Came back six weeks later and took another test. By then, it was, I mean, it was crunch, crunch, crunch. It was dead. That's all that was left. We look at the K2O. It absolutely exhausted that. So, organic carbon, I just put the couple tidbits up here, 5,200 pounds to the acre of organic carbon. This is just the above ground material on June the 8th. Carbon to nitrogen ratio was 21. That's probably a little higher than you think it would be, but there's probably volunteer rye. We've got volunteer rye on every acre now. Because when you let the rye go to antithesis, I guarantee you there will be fertilization taking place on some of these seeds. 
And now that we've taken chemistry out and we've taken it with uh, tillage out, you've got volunteers. So keep that in mind. If you think you're going to plant wheat behind this soybean program, and you're going to take the wheat to grain, and that grain's going to go to the local uh, Clarkson elevator, and Lynn's a nice guy, but he's going to reject every load. He has to, because the, the amount of rye that's going to be in there is going to exceed the form material limits. So just be careful with where and how you do wheat now. I call this the power of patience because you have to wait for this to happen. It goes back to what I mentioned earlier. There's too many times I think in my previous life that I go out on day the first and I say, oh man, the, the, the clover didn't make it. But look what the stuff does in four days. I think you can grab a, a folding chair and watch it grow. It grows that fast. But I really, back to this nodulation idea, we need to figure out a way to score the amount of nitrogen that's in, in the below ground profile. As soil health goes up, human health goes up. I mentioned this earlier, 30% less nutrient density than 25 years ago. Your human health thrives when soil health thrives. I truly believe this. We have to get the health, the soil healthy first, then we get the people healthy. Now, I just wish, I just wish there were, I wish the, the notion of band-aids would just disappear because that's all that's happening, in my opinion, with the healthcare system is that they, 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 there's got to be a pill or a shot for everything. How about we figure out what the root cause is and let's attack it from there. I did something there, and I don't know what I did. <laughs> I made somebody mad. <laughs> I can advance them right here. Yeah, I don't know what happened. I can go straight to my battery. Well, wait a minute. Maybe there's something wrong with the. Whoops. Oh, that's not coming to the screen, Aaron. That's what's wrong. How do I go back? You know, we need to go back. Oh, wow. So it is working from here. But yeah, right there's where we were. For some reason, we're frozen on the screen. All right. I'm going to restart the share. Do we have any questions at this point? Anybody got anything? Any comments? Anything? Yes, sir. Uh, when you were taking those samples, did you have to return the relevant information? I did not do that, but I don't know what all the light. He asked if I had to report relative humidity. That's probably a huge factor in, in the in the end result. All I know, sir, is that I the lab said you measure out two foot by two foot, so that way you can get a percent of an acre, flip it around, put it in the bag, and send it. So they didn't tell me to do it at the AM or the PM. It's just so I don't know. I, I, I can't help you there. Now, when that test comes back, I mean, there is all kinds of, there's protein levels, there's TDA, there's all kinds of stuff that they've done to make, to get to that calculation, okay? But that's probably an important factor, relative humidity. Anybody else? I saw another, another hand. Yes, sir. Yeah, what kind of rate? What was the cocktail rate? Great question. Uh, that particular cocktail had uh, seven pounds of the lawns and fixation clover in it. It had volunteer rye in it. It had uh, a little bit of volunteer vetch. And uh, it had 30 pounds of oats, five or six pounds of sorghum sedan, uh, tillage radish, uh, turnip. Of course, all these things I just mentioned have. have have winter kill, and uh, we're left with the volunteer rye, a little bit of volunteer vetch, and then the uh, seven or eight pounds of balanza uh, fixation flow. Yeah, good question. Got anything? No? No. 
let me. Mm, I broke it. <laughs> any, any, uh, any manure or litter system? Okay, good question. Remove manure or litter or any kind of organic source of, of nutrients. The only place right now that we are using anything like that is on our alfalfa fields because the alfalfa is four or five cuttings and it's full removal. And there's no way that I know of how to get that back with just cover crops. So we bring manure to those locations. But if we're going to raise corn, I'm trying to do it with nothing other than a legume package or I'm, I see there's so many great people out there that, that speak. There's great people in this room. Green cover seed put on webinars. One of their webinar series is with Dr. Christine. It shouldn't happen yet, but you got you got to look this up. You got to listen to them. They're awesome. One of her episodes is us uh, talking about nitrogen and how there is enough microbial um, activity if you can get it turned on to supply all the nitrogen you need to raise to raise a It's all white or blue or feet. What? Then gets me thinking, hey, why don't we look at maybe some stimulants and figure out how to turn some of these back out? So that, that's, that's where I think this could all go someday. But to answer your question, we're trying only to use those products on the fields that get full removed. That was laid back. The, the, the belongs a great question. Are we fall seeding or frost seeding? We've done it both ways. Um, there's no substitute for planting your legumes or any other species for that matter in the fall. There's no substitute for that. When you plant a legume in the fall and it gets established, and I try to, my rule of thumb is to try to get to third trifolium. So now you got to figure out, I need 45 days probably to get there. So when do we need to plant in the fall to make sure we can get there before the first frost comes? Okay, when you can do that and accomplish that, you're going to have way those big numbers like I had on this screen. We also frost seeded clover, vetch, other things in, the, in February and 1st of March. They will work, it'll work, they'll grow, but typically when you do that, they're putting all their growth on the full foliage above ground. They're not doing near the work below ground, and your numbers you're going to see are going to be probably decreased by a third, just because of the fact that it didn't have all of that time to grow in the fall, go through the elements that come out and take off. It will work, but probably not to the degree that I showed on this slide. Thank you. Yes, sir. Do you have do you have like an indicator as far as when you know some such like you like you want crop level to be a certain height or your plus has to be a certain level to fight off the supplement and stuff like that? Yeah. Um we we don't do this anymore. We used to put traps out right now. We start putting traps out to get ready for, for moth flights coming up from the south, and we would do the calculations to figure out when. The peak of that that group was coming. We need to make sure we had no corn that was over B5 growth stage on that date because anything over B5 is going to out of the ground is going to kill it. So that was our number one defensive mechanism here. That's how we made that determination. But now when you wait, and we don't plant corn before Mother's Day. Yeah. So we're probably not planning for home before May 25th. So I don't really even worry about that so much anymore, but I am going to let those army worms go. <coughs> I'm going to let them do, do their thing. And then they'll be gone and disappear. The corn will regrow and away we go. Do I sacrifice you to maintain so home every day? So, you know, I don't talk a lot about yield. That, that, that annoys people because they want to know, well, come on, I want to know what you're doing. Well, it's not about the yield, it's about how much money are you going to make by decreasing the inputs, building soil health, and then look at your ROI at the end of the day. Where so you, have, you have to change your, you got it? We're connected again. We, oh, had, to go, we had to go hardwire, but we're good. So 
you have to now, I'll get to your question, but hang on just a moment. So you now have to change your realistic view of what your yield goals are in this system. Because I'm telling you that this, this is hard. I can take you to a, a field of soybeans that was that yielded an organic field of soybeans that yielded in the 70s. And I can take you to a five miles down the road to a field of organic soybeans that yielded 14. But it's because the field that made 70, I planted that cereal rye along with the cocktail on September the 10th. This cocktail or this cereal rye I planted on December the 1st. Huge difference. So you have to now say, okay, man, I'd love to raise 70 bushel beans, sell them to Lynn Clarkson for $38 a bushel. Love to do that. We'd all love to do that. Can we do that realistically what I'm doing? Probably not. So what is that realistic number? For me, it's 45 to 50 bushel beans. You're going to say, well, that isn't enough beans. But I don't have any expenses. Yes. Do you know where to call the EPA and let us know that? Ooh. No, maybe Aaron can help us on that. Where would I call on like zone five? You're, you're a, a much more south than we are, though. Here. Um, you know, I don't I don't know that. I, here's what I will tell you. Um, I am probably 350 miles south of here. What sound are you near? Uh, just go to Lafayette, Indiana. So, is the clicker working? Yes, everything oh, okay. works. <laughs> you are there you go. All right, we'll get a lucky guess. So five. I don't know if that helps you. What's what's this neck of the woods? You are going to call you five in from north, and I'll be five S and south. But that's a pretty big difference. 350 miles, that's quite a, a difference. Um, so, you know, I don't know what if you had a question behind that comment, uh, but it's so important to understand what is your frost day or what is your first freeze day. You know, I, I love to put sword and Sudan in every cocktail, but if it's going to freeze in 10 days, I, I'm not sure you want to spend that money to put sword and Sudan in that, in that field. So with that being said, my old, my go-to species every single time is cereal rye. Cereal rye is so uh, flexible. <laughs> You intended to, to plant cereal rye on September the 12th, and it got, uh, we got a, a bunch of rain, so you couldn't get in the field, and then the brown froze. And then we hit a stretch of five days of weather where the ground thawed back out on the top two inches, and the field's fit to be on, we'll plant cereal rye. It'll be there next spring. Now, it won't be as good, in my opinion, is if it would have been planted six weeks sooner, but it's better than nothing. Now, is it going to help you with erosion control this fall? No. But it will help you for this farming green, biomass, all of that stuff next, next year. Okay, input reductions. I put this up to show what we've been able to do from 2011 to, to, to current. So we reduced diesel fuel by 48%. We reduced horsepower by 64. So a big part of the fuel savings is that. But the other part of the fuel savings is we're not running multiple passes over the field. We're trying to do this in three passes. A pass in the fall to plant the cover crop, a pass in the spring to plant the cash crop, and a pass to terminate that, that cover crop. That's it. That's all that we're trying to do. Now we do have uh, in row roller, we do have a Romo. Uh, we did not use either one of those in 21. 
So we do have a couple of other pieces of machinery at, at, in our arsenal if we need them. No synthetic in, no bath, no potash, no lime, and no chemistry. So now I then created this slide based on current numbers, and this was built about three weeks ago. So that fuel savings is like $58,000. I didn't even put in the horsepower reduction on the depreciation schedule. That number would be huge. I didn't even put that on here. Synthetic in, math, potash, lime, and these are all averages of what happened in the last 10 or 11 years, because some years we may have had 4,000 acres of corn, the next year we may have had 1,500 acres of corn. So a lot of those are going to kind of shift with whatever crop you're planting. It comes up to $1.349 million. To me, that is a big deal. So then when I look at what we're trying to do, and folks, this is not for everybody. What we're doing here is not for everybody. It's like I said, I'm over there, but we can meet somewhere on this curve and start to reduce our synthetic loads and start taking our risk away from the front end of the equation. Think about how many millions of dollars are spent before you even plant a seed. I mean, the risk is, is huge. I used to live in that world. Cocktail packages prescribed for weed problems. I think this is coming. We are going to be able to sit down and we're going to say, what was your past crop? What's your next crop? What, what weed issues do you have? What's your fertility levels? And we're going to say, okay, based on all this information, all this data, we are now going to prescribe to you this 13-way cocktail and the exudates from those species are going to combat your problems. That's where we're headed. Nutrient density goes up and soil health goes up. There are no failures. I, that's, what, that's what I alluded to earlier. That's too negative of a word. Outcomes we did not expect. How are we not going to do them again? Carbon markets will require soil health practices. I guarantee it. Do not underestimate the power of what's going on in this room. There are many people qualified to be up here talking today instead of me. I'll ask my question now that I always ask. Has anybody in this room been no tilling for 30 years or more? Anybody? Right there. There's, I don't care where I go. Every time I ask that question, there's always at least one person. Where are you from? I'm an hour south of Chicago. An hour south of Chicago. Now, I always say, if you live in that guy's neck of the woods, you need to go find him. Figure out how in the world, how many years have you been there till? It's right around 30, our operation. How have you done that for 30 years and been successful? Thank you. Unfortunately, a farmer's success is measured by yield. That's too, that's too bad. There are, so, there are so many good farmers. I don't care if they till the ground or not. I don't care if they use chemistry or not. There are so many good farmers. And it's way more than just being about yield. Are you socially accepted? Do you have a good family life? Are you being a good steward? Are you conservation minded? Do you cover crop as important as the cash crop? Three pack system, already talked about. Stop looking at single year ROI, take the average, take the average across those six or seven years of crop rotation. Diversity is essential, more biomass the better. Continue the handy soil health test. Do whatever you can to have a cover on every acre. Establish a baseline to monitor change. Test on your own farm. I'm standing up here telling you what is kind of working on our farm, please go home, try these things on small acres and be cautious. And then when you get comfortable, you can start adding more and more diversity. 
Mother Nature has guided me where to go every single step of the way. I don't have enough time to go into the stories, but she has been there pushing me all the way. Do not jeopardize the livelihood of the farm. Progression is real. What I mean by that is when you start to take the tillage and the chemistry away, uh, the first thing that shows up are broadleaf weeds. Then after broadleaf weeds comes grass, and we've got grass. But this is also due to other factors. I think it's due to some compaction. It's due to availability of calcium. We're just, we're out of balance somewhere. I haven't figured it out yet. But right now we are fighting foxtail. We're fighting foxtail too. You're not alone. <laughs> there is something going on. Well, I wish we could, I wish we could have a little foxtail seed and have a super fuel food or something. Because we sure know how to grow it. Remember, the people who are being talked about are the ones who are creating the change. Change is good. The success of next year's cash crop starts with the success of this year's cover crop. Do not make excuses that support your agenda. We all do it all the time. Think about that. Topsoils, young man in Iowa, his name is Mitchell Hora. His company's called Continuum Ag. Again, I don't sell anything. I don't get any money from anything. I just try to give you folks what I see as things that can help. His platform of topsoil is top notch. It's powerful. It will take any flavor of information and you can upload it to his platform. You can query it. You can pressure test it. You can ask him what if. It's got calendars. It's got uh, abilities to track your organic activities throughout the day and are working with our current cert certifying company to then use his platform to just push one button and move everything to them and that's how they're going to audit. That is huge. Annuals become perennials. What I mean by this is when you let these clovers go as far as we are, you let the cereal lie go as far as it is, it is going to produce offspring, and that offspring will be here next year. We've got volunteer rye on almost every field on the farm. We've got volunteer uh, hairy bench, and we're starting to get volunteer clover. I'm okay with that. It's there for a reason. Mother Nature's telling us it's there for a reason. 70-30 rule, 70% 70 of weed suppression is coming from the biomass of the cocktail. The other 30% is coming from the cash crop canopy. This is my rule. I think it may be more like 60-40 in where you are, or 50-50, I don't know. But this is what I'm experiencing. So we are on 20 inch row spacing corn and 20 inch row spacing soybeans. Tillage has to stop. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Aaron Silva. Here we go. April 27th, no tilling soybeans into cereal rye. Now I was taught by my schooling and my father that corn is king. You do whatever you can to plant corn. I don't care what you do, you plant corn and you do not worry about soybeans that are secondary crop. That is so wrong. I am never, hopefully ever, will plant corn before Mother's Day again. So now, thank you to Aaron, we now have an opportunity to get our soybeans planted before we even crack open the first pro box of corn. And that's what we're doing. Does this always work on the right timing? No, it does not. Because Mother Nature will say, I'm going to rain for three weeks now, and you can come up to plant W. And that's what we have to do. But in this particular video, that was on April the 27th. Now, when I set up a little mini series like I'm doing, this is the same feel throughout this little series. There's the baby. There's the 60-foot roll of trimmer. Now, 
it, it, it may appear as though that rye is not laying down very well, and it's not today because we really need more biomass. This is 100 pounds of cereal rye. We're up to 150 now. We plant, we drill 150 pounds of cereal rye on seven and a half inch centers this fall. Okay, so we're trying to do this at V1 and a half to V2. And, and now here's the reason why this works. Well, there's many reasons, but here's one. The time period from boot stage to anthesis is 35 to 45 days, somewhere in that ballpark. The, and so the reason why this works is because you can terminate cereal rye when it's dropping pollen or slash anthesis. But the critical thing here to realize is the growth stage of the soybean plant. If we get beyond V2 and a half head for V3, we're going to probably do too much damage to the bean plant. We're going to break branches, shred leaves, and it's not going to be very pretty. So that's why this works. So think about that timing. So it's okay if you roll at any time at end thesis or later, it's still going to lay the right end. The question is, when did you plant the beans on the front end of this? So if you were a week after boot stage, which is fine, you can be after anthesis a little bit, okay? So just depending on the growth stage of the soybean. But now I'm gonna talk a little bit more. I got some, a lot of other stuff to cover, but there's other reasons why we're gonna let that ride go also. Okay, so here now I got out of the tractor and you can see, look at all that thatch and mulch that is still there from the previous year. Here comes the roller. Those were the soybeans there that, that were there before the roller gets there. I almost got my toe ran over here. I didn't realize how close it, I mean, when you're shooting a video, you don't realize how <laughs> close everything is. And the driver assumed that I was gonna get out of the way. So anyway, Again, that rye doesn't look like it's laid down very good, but folks, it will go ahead and lay on down. Now, here come the soybeans. They're just fine. They're, they're, you pull the, the, the look, and, and you can see now that we kind of lightly, for lack of a better word, dinged those soybeans. We've sent a message to that plant to stack nodes because that apical bud has gotten bruised, let's call it, just a little bit. That picture is a perfect stage. That, that's what we saw, perfect stage. Yeah. And actually, I think we could even be a little sooner rolling because see, here's what happens. Now, here's the, remember, everything we do has unintended consequences, everything. So now, Rick has told you he's jacked his elbow right uh, rate up to 150 pounds to the eight. That is a lot. So now in the spring, when you've now got those beans planted and they are coming out of the ground, they are going to be reaching for the sky. And when they reach for the sky, they elongate and we are changing their physiological structure. So this is why I would propose that. I, I would venture to say that I rewind that video, but I would say those beans are closer to V one and a half row stage. That's like Aaron said, that's probably the sweet spot. If we let these beans go too long in these massive biomass cocktails, we are drastically changing their physiological structure. Probably affecting yield if we do that. Okay, there's the same fuel on July 19th. So now, okay. So this is where we say, okay, don't want to be over with me, that's fine. So now, if we're still using a little bit of cumin, I don't know if everyone in the room is organic or not, but let's assume you're not. If we're still using a little bit of chemistry, this is where we've totally eliminated the burn down pass. Look at where we've gotten to on July 19th. And it's hard to see through your seats, but that, that brown, dry mat batch is right there. It's right there. But you see, the 70-30 rule hasn't kicked in yet for here. 
We're starting to get a few escapes. There's some foxtail coming. I don't know why that works sometimes, and sometimes it doesn't. There's foxtail coming right here. You can see it. There's a couple of bear's tail right here. But honestly, there's not a lot to worry about here. Okay, again, we have to be flexible with what we're doing. This, this video was taken two years ago. We did not, we didn't plan anything in April. We planned nothing in May. Everything happened in June. Well, the rye's already in anthesis. It's lodging. So I decided to roll the rye first and then plant the soybeans. I like this method too. The only issue with this method is, is look at the date. Now, granted, we couldn't have been in the field before this anyway, so we had no choice. But you've given up 30 to 35 days of time with photosynthesis to get to this point. Now, folks, that rye is dead. It's gone. Here's what it looks like on July 16th. And I didn't stop and take any particular spot in the field. I just stopped my truck, got out, and took a picture. Again, we've opened up the opportunity for total elimination of burn down chemistry. In my opinion, this is how every bean should be grown in the United States. The cereal rye and this benefit. There's the same field on October the 17th. I mean, that field is cleaner than our neighbor's fields that spray multiple times. Okay, again, thank you, Aaron, for teaching me how to do this. The six principles of soil health. I know most of us know what they are, but I want to quickly go through this. Minimize disturbance. That was intended for chemistry and tillage. Uh, maximize diversity, living roots and armor the soil. There's been another one added recently. This one is critical. Context. Where are you in the world? I'm talking about things that are, I'm doing 350 miles south of here. Are they, are they all going to work here? No, but the first four principles will work anywhere in the world. But the question is, what's the species you're going to plant? When are you going to plant it? How are you going to terminate? Those are the things that need to be determined, and that's done through the context. The sixth one is livestock. Again, it's not for everybody. Now, we are in the great state of Wisconsin. There's a lot of dairy cattle here. If I was a farmer close to a dairy, I would be talking to that dairy and say, would you be willing to let your yearling heifers come and graze on our farm for three months and then you can take it back for a rate of payment. That's the kind of conversations I'm trying to have. I have not gotten our dairy convinced to do that. I don't know why they won't, they won't try it, but they just won't, but that's what I would try to do. And then if I may, I would like to add a seventh one to this list, and that is commitment. You need to be committed to do this. You're not just partially pregnant. It's either all in or all out. You've got to be committed, okay? I, I'm never going back, never, never. Are we, have we sacrificed yield? Oh yeah. When you look at the heyday of when we were 100% no-till, 100% cover crop, and we were reduction of chemistry and fertilizer by 60 to 65%, okay? So eight or nine years ago. When we were at that point, we had the best ROIs we ever had and our system was stable. And what I mean by that is, our yields were not would not fluctuate in a cornfield by more than five bushels as you drove through the field. That is stability. Right now, and again, I do not talk about this very often, but I need you need to be aware of this is not all candy canes and lollipops. We have reduced yield by 20% by stepping off this deep end 
into a no-till organic situation. And we've got noise now. But we're working on it. We're, we're getting the noise trimmed back down and we're going to start moving to the next level on these yields. It just takes time. It's no different than being a massive destruction of soil farmer and then decide that you come to one of these seminars and decide, you know what, I'm going to start doing no till crop crop. That's a drastic change. That's what we're doing, drastic. Diversity. I think of diversity three ways. Multiple species cocktails. This is number one. So we get started, we're going to plant one or two species, which I highly recommend because I'm telling you folks, the it's it's imperative that you have success the first time you try these drastic things because if you don't you're not coming back you're going to throw your hands up you're going to say i told you so i told you that wouldn't work here <laughs> so please don't do that one or two species get started but then we've got to add the diversity as time goes on number two annuals and perennials when you stop and think about the cocktails we create, they are almost all annuals. That's not good enough. But now hold on a minute. What is your termination method? If your termination method is chemistry, then throw the kitchen sink at it. Get your grasses, get your brassicas, get everything in there. But if you're not going to terminate, chemically, and you're going to terminate either with cold temperature or mechanical of either roller tramper or flail chopper, now you're looking at a different set of species. So you got to be careful here. The only perennial that we are trying to use right now is alfalfa. That's not enough, but I don't know how else to control because I've got a mess on my hands. For the last year, that we decided to finally eliminate chemistry, I, I introduced chicory to a couple fields. Oh my gosh, what a mistake. It is a tremendous species for what, if I was gonna build a forage package for a dairy, it would be the, one of the first top three species I put in there because it's that good. But man, you cannot kill it. It's a perennial, it's got a, a big old hulk and tap root, and it is set in there for life. So now I don't till. So now what we're trying to do is, and if there's any grazers in here, close your ears, but we're gonna fence one of these fields off. We're gonna get, we've already got the sheep and we're gonna turn the sheep loose and we're gonna let them take it to the ground. And I'm hoping that the pressure that they can apply on it Will 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 hurt it enough to start thinning it it out. Plus, plus chicory is a natural. Um, what's the word um, for sheep? It keeps them from getting parasites. I can't think of the word I want. Yeah, it's like a natural dewormer. So it's it's all going to work out. Then the other field we've got this mess in. We established twenty seven pounds of about about alpha twenty seven pounds to the acre of alpha this fall. And I'm going to try and smother it out with multiple cuts and then the growth of the shading. So hopefully we can overcome this chicory that way. I mean, the stuff is, is, is insanely hard to get rid of. Co-mingle cash crops. This is where we're headed. There's already people doing this. We're doing this. I think this is going to be the wave of the future because we still don't understand the 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 synergies that are taking place below our feet. And I've got this P on here because this is important for you folks here in these cold states. This is a cold tolerant P. And this, that is wheat beside it. That's wheat growing right here. So we planted these cold tolerant peas into an established wheat field. This widens your window of opportunity to plant a legume by 30 to 40 days. That's a big deal. That is a big deal. Because when you get to October the 10th here, you pretty much probably better forget legumes. Is that correct? October the 10th, maybe? Depending on the weather, but typically. 
So now we planted these particular peas on December the 1st. That really opens up your opportunity. Um, we are going to co-mingle um, corn and soybeans. I found some corn that's only gets about six feet tall. And we're going to harvest corn and soybeans with the grain table all at the same time. We're going to grow peas and corn. We're going to just let the peas be the fuel for the corn. We're going to try uh, to also do the short stash of corn and the peas, harvest the peas and the corn together. In the spring, you could plant oats and peas together. That'd be very easy to, to separate. Uh, again, let's go back to the cattle scenario. If you've got a dairy close to you, you've got a working relationship with them, plant peas, triticale, or whatever other forage plant you want to plant, raise that crude protein by four or five percent and take it into their system as, as a haylage. There's just all kinds of things we could do here. So this, I think, is, is, is one of the most critical parts of soil health is diversity. And those are my three ways of looking at it. There it is again. There's that pea growing in there. And there's the wheat right beside it. All right. This is what a lot of our fields are looking like now because, again, this field right here hasn't had any tillage or any chemistry in nine years. So we are building this mat, this mulch, uh, whatever you want to call it, is, is coming, pretty much showing up in almost every field now. We're planting the peas right here in this scenario. There were the peas, uh, they were planted three inches deep on November 1st. This particular video, or this particular shot was, the one before was planted on December the 1st. This, was, this picture was taken on December the 10th. I figured we were in trouble because we planted and the ground level's about right here somewhere. I figured that once these got out of the ground on December the 10th, it was over. But they, they burned off at the at ground level, that, that green that was growing and burned froze off. And then the bean or the peas went into um, uh, dormancy, hibernation, whatever you want to call it. They came out next spring and there they are growing alongside the wheat. So now this gives you an opportunity, like I said, you could take this off as wheat leach, you could take this to grain and, and still sell the wheat and the peas together to the dairy. They most dairies have hammer mills. They can hammer mill those peas down to the size that the cattle can consume and digest, or you take them to seed and you separate them and you sell them as wheat and you sell them as peas. There the peas are again, right there, ready, ready to rock and roll. All right, epigenetics. I know I'm running out of time, I'm gonna pass time, but this is important. This is where we are now headed. Read that. Heritable phenotype changes that do not involve alterations to the DNA sequence. So here's what I mean. We have gone back to uh, 30, 35 years back, we have gathered seeds from soybean varieties that are off patent. This is, a, this is critical. You cannot go to your bin and, and bin run your endless three soybeans. You can't do that. But you can go back in time and get beans that are off patent, and now you own those. So we are now, we've grown these beans out. We've got a, we got a handful of 10 varieties. We grew them out. A handful became a five gallon bucket. Then a five gallon bucket became a pro box. Then a pro box became enough for 50 acres or 100 acres or whatever. That's where we are now. We're doing the same thing with corn. I've gone back 80 years on genetics of corn. And in some instances, even further than that, we're going to start using some open pollinator. I mean, my gosh, that probably came from Spain or Mexico, or who knows how many years old that stuff is. But the point is, we're not, we're going to see, again, on small acres, we're going to see 
if these beings are going to adapt to our system. Because again, it's like I often say, there are many qualified people in this room that get to speaking and not me today, but I'm, I'm honored to be here. But the other thing we got to think about is, I'm not reinventing the wheel up here either. A lot of the things I've talked about, a lot of the things that you folks are doing have already been done. I can remember when I was a 14 year old kid and dad said, get the wagons out. It's, we're going to cut beans this afternoon. It's going to be perfect. The beans are going to get down to 12% moisture. It's going to be a nice 75 degree day and we're going to cut our beans for next year's seed. I'm like, Dad, why are we doing that? I mean, I'm 14 years old. Dad, why are we doing that? Son, I think that these beans are adapting to our farm, and I'm going to continue to use the same bean year after year after year. We did this 40 years ago. So not, we're not reinventing the wheel here. We're just bringing back thoughts that we may have, have misplaced for a while. Take advantage of the free stuff. Photosynthesis. The energy from the sun is powerful and it is free. The, the, the one thing that we need to consider is we need to think about how much oxygen can we pump into the ground and how much sugar can we pump into the ground. That's what it's all about. Here's that sewer rice line and I'm going to go quickly. Is lunch like a set time? I mean, are they serving right now? Uh, all right, here's that cereal rice line. Remember, I had the 12 inch, the 18 inch, and the 28 inch line. What I've tried to do here is I've taken the current values that things are at right now. So the nitrogen is at 83 cents a pound, P's at 91, K's at 65. I did the math of what that end means on a dollar. Uh, amount. So when you got to this 28 inch line, look at this $352 of just N, P, and K were brought out of that above ground plant. This is why we can start to think about eliminating certain inputs. Nitrogen is all around us, it's free. 78.1% of the air we breathe contains nitrogen. Let's capture some of that with these legumes. Here's that, here's that legume slide I had on. May 20th, total of $236. June the 4th, up to $380. June the 8th, $785. I mean, it's not all available, but by golly, we sure got a heck of a head start. There, I use the same prices on the NP and the K. I'm only trying to instill a thinking process here to start to pull back on synthetic inputs. September the 18th. This is how we, this is one of the ways we do corn. Now, to get to September the 18th and to get the crop, uh, cover crop looks like that, you're going to have to either follow a cereal grain, you're going to need a regen year, or maybe cattle. Because you're not going to pull soybeans off in time to get that to look like that by September the 18th. This is following a wheat field. All right. This is what patience looks like. We need the, this biomass to feed the corn and suppress the weeds. There's the volunteer rye I was talking about. That rye was not planted. That's where we are on this volunteer. And it, this was an experiment, folks, because that is frosty bursine clover. And the reason why I use frosty bursine here is because we grazed cattle the year before, and frosty bursine is non globy but it still puts on a stem the size of your pinky and it's hollow and it will crunch with the roll of pepper if you do it at the right time. I decided that this field was fit to plant and we went in and planted and as you'll notice, there are no blooms out yet. This is what it looks like when I got off the tractor and I wanted you to see that it looks like a jungle up above, but look at how nice it nestled in this corn seed is. 
I didn't do anything but dug down with my finger until I found it and I stopped. Now, again, there are no blooms on this clover. Big no-no. You're not going to terminate this with a roll of crimper. Now, unfortunately, I do not have the video for that. I don't know why. I can't find it. But we ran the crimper here to see if we can knock this down. We could not. So then we get to here. Remember, I said you've got to be flexible. So there's some volunteer veterinary, see the purple blooms, and there's the white blooms of the clover, and there are corn plants in here. Uh, right there, some. Right there, Sam. This is going to be now the corn's too tall to roll. So my experiment was not a failure, but we realized we cannot think about terminating these clovers until they have our bloom. And typically, what well, my rule of thumb is when you've got that white. Uh, bloom on that fixation or, or, or bursting, and then the outer perimeter starts to turn brown. Now we're ready to roll. Okay, so then what we did was we turned that flail chopper loose, and the flail chopper we set it to cut right above the corn, and then the corn came up through. Here's alfalfa no tilling corn in the standing alfalfa. This alfalfa is about 30 inches tall. It's probably three quarter bloom. And this is how I like to plant corn. Now, look at that. Isn't that beautiful? Well, I got there's another video. I, I never know which one of these two videos to fit on the presentation, so I just put them both on. Um, but what we're trying to do here is we're trying to no till corn into this alfalfa. The reason why we're not cutting the alfalfa and taking the first cutting off is because when you cut alfalfa, what's it want to do? It wants to regrow. And when it regrows, it takes moisture and nutrients from the profile that we're going to need for that corn. So now, folks, this is extremely dangerous. Extremely. I'm asking you to plant a warm season grass, which is corn, into an established perennial, which is alfalfa. It's just about suicide. So please do not do this on 800 acres. Do this on 10 and see what happens. So now we come back with the rule and we're doing this at B2. You're not gonna hurt the corn. And we're laying the alfalfa down. We know it's not gonna terminate. We know that. We're just trying to lay the alfalfa down and give the corn now a shot at the sunlight so that it can take off. We've done this for four years now. Now, this is even more, read that, this is perseverance. The corn survived two waves of black coat worm. This is the final product of the three-pass corn system. I'm hopeful of this system for corn production. There's the corn on August the 2nd. So now let's go back to my 70-30 rule. My 70-30 rule is 70% of wheat suppression is happening with the cover crop slash alfalfa. 30% is happening with the cash crop canopy. But here's what's happening now. The cash crop canopy is crushing the alfalfa. So when you walk out into this field, I should have taken pictures out in the field, I apologize. But the alfalfa is looking like it's being attacked by weevils. It's yellow, every leaf has fallen off its own ground and the alfalfa is crumbling. We've done this now for four years and out of four years, three out of the four, you will not see a spring of alfalfa in that field at harvest, not one. But now here's what's happening. Two years later, we're now starting to see alfalfa reappear. And I, I, I made this comment a couple days ago in Kansas, and somebody there had a pretty good idea. They said, I think what's happened is you've got some hard seed there. There was an allelopathic effect on the first year or two with the alfalfa. You know, as you know, if you if you put young alfalfa and established the establishment will, will kill that young alfalfa. 
So then that hard seed laid there for two years until that allele pathogen effect was gone. And now here comes the alfalfa. And we're starting to get that alfalfa show back up. So again, signals Mother Nature's telling us, I don't know what it is yet, but we'll, we'll, we'll try to get there. This illustrates my definition of farming green. It's just out there all by yourself. You're doing very minimal disturbance. I, I really like where we're headed here. It's not perfected by any way, shape, or form of the imagination, but we are getting better. Uh, we're going to quickly move through this. Sacrifice, I'm almost done. Sacrifice yield to maintain soil health. Do it every day. Grow the nitrogen meat with legumes and cocktails that include each of the four categories. Again, go back to green cover, look it up. Dr. Christine Jones, she spent a whole episode on this. Plant green in the living covers, plant beans in the 72 inch tall line, plant corn in the soil line. We can do this if we bring nitrogen forward into the system. So okay, I have 23 plants. I think I had 30 or whatever. I don't even remember what the number was. Park your plant on a matter of day. I don't care what your neighbors are doing. If it's not fit to be in your field, it won't be in it. That's it. Hopefully, I'll never plant corn in April again. Plant multiple cash crops in the same field. Totally eliminate all inputs. No CFAP government subsidy payments in 2020. Zero. Eliminated crop insurance four years ago. I know it says three, but I need to update the slide. Four years ago, no crop insurance. No longer any government programs, ARP or PLC. I appreciate all the work the young lady did. It was great information, but I just don't care anymore. Regen acres, no cash crop. Certified organic with no tillage, three paths. To truly be regenerative, you have to take everything away. And I mean everything. I know I'm out of time, but I want to say this. This regenerative movement that, that we are experiencing right now is gaining traction, gaining momentum, and is farmer led. This is critical. Here's the problem there is no definition that everyone agrees on. There is no definition that the farmer agrees on. There is no definition that the shipper agrees on. There is no definition that the, the processor agrees on and that the consumer agrees on. This is this is not good. How do we know what our goal? How do we know what goal ahead for? We don't know what that goal is. This 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 definition needs to be figured out quickly, and it needs to be a definition. I'm very extreme. Is that I'm too extreme, but let's find some middle ground somewhere and let's come up with a regenerative definition that fits everybody. If you are not uncomfortable with what you are doing, then you are not trying hard enough to change. I don't care what it is to do. I challenge everyone here to get a little uncomfortable. I think you'll like how it feels. I'm proud to be a farmer. But I'm way more proud of the way I farm. I call it regenerative organic stewardship with no tillage. Thank you very much. Sorry I ran over. We had technical difficulties. I, we don't have time for QA now. So catch me, find me, and now Aaron's going to give us some. I'll orders. give you your marching orders. So lunch is being served in the breakfast room that we started in. Um, we are might start a little bit later given the time shift, which again we have the technical difficulties. So I appreciate Rick's patience through that. I, I said you guys would be ready to slap me, and slap me, but. Please put your masks on. It is UW policy and, and City of Madison policy, and I don't want to do anything to compromise our ability to keep doing O grade programming. So I know it's a hassle, but please, please, please put your mask on as you, you go through. I really, really appreciate um, the, the patience with our policies. So have lunch. Uh, the other thing is, I mentioned O grade compass. Um, John Henderson and Jim Munch can show you the O-Grain Compass tool um, and show you how changing your practices and how that could be used to, to estimate costs of, of production. So 
they'll be in the lunchroom and uh, can help you if you, if you want to um, walk through that tool. But thank you again, Rick, for awesome. awesome. You've got that presentation on the, on the computer? Yeah. Yeah, it's all yours. All right, thank you. Excuse me, let me reach across you. Yes, sir. Okay, I'm going to try to just a script. Uh-huh.